Yeah. Dos minutos. Dos minutos. Okay. We are giving people two more minutes to arrive mm -hmm. and then we'll start. Pero los mexicanos que requieren ponca van a ser ustedes. Y claro, queda en el canal. Se los voy a pasar. Ah, muy bien. Sí, luego te voy a... Ya, luego les voy a pedir las, este, todos los enlaces porque me piden todo. Ya ver. Un día. We are starting now. Hello, everybody, and welcome. And how nice to see you all here. Thank you very much to Unam and Kate for uh, inviting me for, for this talk. And uh, this talk is going to be about the influence of William Blake in the Mexican novelist, which is not a very common thing. And the Mexican novelist is myself. And, and I will be talking a bit about this story of how I wrote my novel Ciudad Doliente de Dios, which is unfortunately only in Spanish, but the talk will be in English. The, the title of the novel in English could be something like Doleful City of God. And it was published in December 2018 by Alfaguara in Mexico and the UNAM in a co-edition. So I'm going to, to read the talk eh, because it is, there's a lot to, to say about how Blake, William Blake came into my life and my writing when I was living in Mexico and how I, in a way, it has something to do with my ending up here and how it took me from the moment I started writing this novel till the moment it was published, eh, 20 years elapsed. So, Hey, well, that's the cover of the of the novel. You'll have to forgive my Mexican accent if you don't understand something. Just say so. So we we will start. Uh, that is a a quote from William Blake that I use in my novel. Imagination is not a state; it's the human existence itself. That's what William Blake believes profoundly, and I believe that profoundly as well. Creating form and beauty around the dark regions of sorrow. These worlds might well sum up my novel subject matter. In his poem, Milton, <clears throat> Blake writes, some sons, sons of love surround the passions with forces of iron and silver, creating form and beauty around the dark regions of sorrow giving to airy nothing a name and a habitation delightful, with bounds to the infinite, putting off the indefinite into most holy forms of thought. Such is the power of inspiration. They labor incessant with many tears and afflictions, creating the beautiful house for the pitiful sufferer. So, um, I will start from the beginning. I met William Blake in hell. Hell, in this case, was a shopping center in McAllen, Texas. A, a shopping mall, <clears throat> I have to explain this. I was born in Guadalajara, which is in the northwest of Mexico. Not north-north, but where the north starts. 
and that means also ideologically. And in, in, the, in the milieu where I grew up uh, in that time, it was like the, the part of Mexico that wanted to be invaded by the United States right away. So families from the milieu where my family belonged thought that holiday, the concept of holidays was shopping in Texas because everything in Mexico was, according to that vision, very badly done. Clothes, you write in paper, makeup, everything. You have to go to Texas, to McAllen, Texas, and buy it. And, um, and the very last trip I made with them as a teenager, I, I was a quite tormented young woman, and I had started to rebel against that concept of holiday. And I was also a bit snobbish because I had decided already that I wanted to be a writer. So I thought, well, I don't want to buy clothes, which wasn't entirely true. I did want some clothes, but I didn't admit it. I said, I only want books. And that was very difficult because it's very, very difficult, or at least it was then, to find a bookshop in Macallan, Texas. Very hard, but I found one in that shopping mall. And I was desperate to run away from that awful hell. And there I found the Penguin William Blake collector points. I have no idea how the book got to that God for second place, but it did. And I took the book from the, from the shelf in the bookshop. And um, the first thing that uh, called my attention was the, was the cover because it was, it was one of Blake's illustrations. And I had heard talk about Blake, but I had never seen his, his art. So I was very, very impressed by that. And then I read what, it, what, um, what was in the back cover. And Blake there was described as an artist, poet, mystic and visionary who created poetic worlds illuminated by his spiritual and revolutionary beliefs that have fascinated, intrigued and enchanted readers for generations. So I bought the book immediately and I thought this is going to save me. And, um, it gave me an idea of, of um, the image of a wall artist that Blake was and believed in, and uh, the artist's task and his or her destiny. And uh, it gave me one thought. And as Blake says in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, one thought feels immensity. So I talked about hell in McAllen, Texas, but also. Guadalajara, the city where I was born, that's the, the cathedral. To me, that city was hell as well. I, I, it was a very conservative city, lovely, very beautiful. And as you can see, I have the file, Blake's illustrations and make collages with them. Uh, I hope Blake forgives me for that. And um, everything that surrounded me as a very young woman and a teenager and a very young woman was hell. It was, to me, everything was, felt death, everything talk of blind obedience, submission, mediocrity, the dulling of the intellect, the soul, the sense. Of course, I was exaggerating, I was very young and tormented, so all young tormented, so um, uh, people who want to be artists or writers have to think this way. And uh, I wanted to escape. And I wanted to surround myself with beauty. So that year I left my parents' home the same year that I went to McAllen, Texas for the last time, thank goodness, carrying my Blake complete poems with me. And I confess I was intimidated by the difficulty of Blake's prophetic poems, which are the longest ones, where, where he develops his uh, mythology and his cosmology, or the enigmatic marriage of heaven and hell. But I kept on reading, trying to get at the core of that poetry that eluded me. The book was like an amulet, the thought still unraveled that feel immensity, immensity. I had left the parental home. I became free. I became like a man spending lots of time on my own in cafes because in that time, in Guadalajara, only men did that. So I just went to cafes to write and read and read the papers. The only thing I didn't do that men did was to smoke cigars. And I had this, early habitude of writing in cafes and watching life go by from cafes has stayed with me forever and it has a lot to do with the novel as you will see later. 
On finding this freedom, <clears throat> I discovered that any city, even Guadalajara, could become Golgonusa. For the unenlightened, for Blake, Golgonusa is the sacred city of arts and science. And I realized that any city can be that if you just choose your own perspective. <clears throat> so it was some 40 years ago that the seed of this novel started growing, though of course I didn't know it at the moment. <clears throat> The seed was an alchemical compound of literature, solitude, a city, the discovery of my own thought in solitude, the perhaps innocent sorrows of my tormented youth allayed by beauty, and the certainty that art was the only real form of transcendence I could possibly find. Because of many of the books I read, and thanks to the Instituto Anglo Mexicano de Cultura, where I was studying English and where I became an Anglophile a very, in a very intense manner, I started to become obsessed with Brit Britain in general and with London in particular. I confess Blake was the British author I found hardest to grasp. All those names and complications of the prophetic poems. I have not seen hardly any of his illustrations, so it was always mysterious and hard to read the edition of the complete poems that make reference to all the plays with the illustrations. I have no idea what they were talking about, but still I was determined to get him. I don't know why. I sort of even fear William Blake because I couldn't understand him, but um, I, 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 I still felt he has something to tell me. It's like the most complicated relationship I've ever had with an author, very, very often. Then when I was 24, I found a gold bonus, more of my liking. I moved to Mexico City, that's from the plane when you are arriving at night, that's Mexico City. A monstrous, wonderful, fascinating city. I still carry my, my by now most battered legs complete poems with me. And for a while, I tried to translate some of his uh, youth poems from the poetical sketches. I even conceived the mad project of translating his complete works, which of course I never did, to see if I could that way get to the core of his vision. The big question to which I still have no answer is why? Why was I so stubborn if I did not even understand him? I'll come to this later. Um, of course, I kept on working in cafes in Mexico City. That's the Gabi's Cafe in the Colonia Juarez. Um, and uh, I continued with that tradition, working, uh, reading Blake and trying to work him out. But now let's talk a bit about politics. I guess I am a rebellious soul, but I have never been truly interested in politics per se. What I've already truly what I've always truly cared about is literature and art in general as a form of transcendence, indistinguishable from our soul's journey. That is probably the only real faith I've ever had, and I guess it is not so distant from true religious feeling, even if I don't know who my god or gods are, and I have in fact become a, a Buddhist, in that Buddhism there's no gods. The people who know me may love to hear me say this. If I'm not interested in politics, why have I been involved with it, with it uh, so often in my life? Throughout my life, I have found several ways of showing dissent on my own in written form or working with other people. I would say that this is a response of a human soul in the face of injustice, violence, and impunity. There is an essential solidarity in the mere fact of being human, and that is what stops us from keeping silent. But no, I am not interested in politics. I don't find it exciting. I find there are just another of those childish games we adults play pretending we have grown up, so that no one can see how fragile and scared we are. Among those games, I think it's one of the most boring ones. But in it, power is real. <clears throat> and so is its destructive potential. What really touches me then is the pain that such power can inflict on people, which is part of the broader scope of human pain. 
William Blake defines the source of such anger when he makes the prophet Isaiah say in the marriage of heaven and hell, the voice of honest indignation is the voice of God. Around 1997, out of the blue, I conceived the very vague idea of a novel. All I knew was that it would try to ask whether there is any redemption for human pain. I was not thinking much about an intimate kind of pain, but rather about the pain of humanity, which is a very grand subject. I was thinking of war, for instance, the Balkans war. And I was also involved at the time in several ways supporting the indigenous uh, Zapatista army of national liberation, which had stood up in arms in 1994 in South Mexico, southeast of Mexico. And I followed closely all the terrible things that were happening in my country, the violence, the repression, the corruption. For some very mysterious reason that I still can't quite unravel, I was convinced that this was where William Blake truly came into my life and into my writing. I decided firmly that the characters of my novel could only come from Blake's prophetic poems, that is from his cosmology. Exactly those poems that I couldn't understand. <laughs> but I was reckless <clears throat> and I started writing, centered around the story of a girl who would embody any Tharmon and who had been left by her adoptive parents to be educated in a religious orphanage. Those adoptive parents were Ahania and Luva. All these are symbolic characters in Blake's prophetic poems. The reason why they were her adoptive and not her real parents was because they were symbolic figures, as her own existence was as well. In this novel, all characters would have a double reality, that of corporeal life in this material world and the reality of vision. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is not really very relevant. I don't, I don't say very much about this. Um, I was working on this when Acteal happened. What led us to this horrid event is too complicated to explain here. Let's just say that a few days before Christmas on 22 December 1997, 45 indigenous people, most of them children and women, some of them pregnant, were massacred in the state of Chiapas in Mexico by a large group of paramilitaries while they were praying for peace in a makeshift church. These are people mourning, mourning for, for the dead. They were already victims when this happened, displaced from their communities, where their houses had been burned and pillaged. There had been rumors that they would be attacked. They supported the goals of the Zapatista struggle, but not the recourse to arms. They belonged to a pacifist community called Las Abejas, which means the beef, who instead of fleeing when the threats of further violence came, gather in their humble temple to pray for peace. It was while praying that they were attacked by the paramilitary groups. Those are well, the, the coffins of the victims. The killing, horrendous and methodical, lasted for hours while the state police and army stood nearby listening to the screams. Not that it was the first horror taking place in Mexico in those days, but it was one of the most brutal ones, one of the most tainted with impunity, and it was very traumatic for the country as a whole. whole. We didn't know how much worse things could get, but that's another story. With a vast group of uh, people I had already been working with, we organized some demonstrations and held a concert with many rock bands in order to give information of what was really happening because the national media wasn't doing that and to gather aid for the victims and refugees. The concert took place in Mexico City beneath the wings of the angel of independence and we need a glorious full moon. <clears throat> Most of the people gathered there were very young. So you could say that orc spirit was there. Orc in Blake is the untamed rage and beauty of rebellious youth. Then we travel to the refugees camp in Polo, Chiapas, very close to the place of the massacre. Chiapas is one of the most beautiful states in Mexico. Green hills roll all around you, sometimes enveloped in mist. And among the beauty, there was a footprint of such horror. 
What I saw there left me with questions I still cannot answer, no one can. How can we make sense of human pain? How can we make sense of the random choices of history through which some people are massacred instead of others? How can there be redemption for ravaged innocence for the children that I saw there hungry and ill and scared? It is true that in the refugee camp, I saw grief faced with such courage and dignity that one felt almost hopeful in spite of the misery, the sickness and the pain. But courage and dignity don't by themselves redeem pain. Or do they? Is it enough for courage and dignity to exist in the invisible realm of the human heart in order to transform the condition of victim into triumph? I admit we are talking about rather metaphysical issues here, but still I, I ask, I wonder, if we concede such triumph exists, the triumph of courage and dignity, what does it consist of? Of taking up arms as the Ezeta Elena did, or of offering the other sheik, or gathering to pray in the face of threats at Las Abejas did before being attacked and murdered? So all the people I was working with were surely asking themselves questions on similar lines. I must say that metaphysical questions were not exactly welcome, and it wouldn't have been thought pertinent to mention triumphs in an invisible realm when what was patently urgent was the here and now. I learned a lot then. I learned a lot working with all these people. It was wonderful in many ways. And yet, Though we were, gen we were generally united in our sorrow or anger and our thirst for justice, there were things that, when the euphoria of collective achievement subsided, were not quite right for me. <clears throat> Deep inside, I felt isolated spiritually and intellectually. Um, I, I sense that numbers brought comfort, the mutual reaffirmation of ideas, but there there was a lot of trust in banners and rallying cries, but the things of the spirit were perhaps not very much questioned. So it was then that after so many years, during all this time uh, involved in, in, in this, in this uh, protest and, and conflict, I finally understood why William Blake's work had the seed of an answer to such difficult questions. It lighted the way to a deeper, more subtle and at the same time radical understanding of the transcendence of human imagination and its fruits in the face of the horrors endured by mankind. Blake wrote in the first chapter of his long poem, Jerusalem. And this is the manner of the sons of Albion in their strength. They take two contraries which are called qualities with which every substance is clothed. They name them good, name them good and evil. From them, they make an abstract, which is negation, not only of the substance from which it is derived, a murderer of its own body, but also a murderer of every divine member. It is the reasoning power, an abstract, objecting power that negatives everything. This is the specter of man, the holy reasoning power, and in its holiness is closed the abomination of the isolation. Blake denounced social injustice, the oppression of church and state, the misery he saw in the streets of London, and he acknowledged that org, meaning revolution, was an essential part of the human spirit. But he also understood that it could become stagnant, revolution could become stagnant, that it had to be transcended to, or oppression would ensue again. Shortly after these events, I went to work on the novel for two months and a half at Ledig House, a writer's colony in upstate New York, where I managed to immerse myself more in Blake. I was still obsessed with the question, well, that, that's Ledig House, sorry. I was still obsessed with the question of what's the point of human pain and the possibility of its redemption? How can we go on living when there is so much suffering in the world? And one afternoon, while writing, surrounded by that most beautiful and peaceful landscape, I found myself introducing the whole actual horror into the novel. Furthermore, from that moment on, it became a very important part of its plot. I didn't know, I still don't know, if I had a right to 
use such a tragedy, to use is a horrible word, conserving real people for a piece of literature. But I could not go on writing without mentioning it. Actel, this tragedy simply forced itself into the novel. That St. James's in Piccadilly, where William Blake was baptized. Soon after that sojourn in Lake House in April 1999, I set foot for the first time in my life in the real Golgonusa, spiritual, fourfold London, as Blake said in his poem Milton. And I have come to stay, so I didn't know so at the moment. To talk about my obsession with London would require another talk. I'll just say that by the time I arrived here, the abstraction of human pain, war and the great tragedies of the world have narrowed a bit and become rather more personal. My first years in London had much of personal hardship and pain, and I could well see the cruel face of the city, again quoting Blake in Jerusalem, London, that human awful wonder of God. But London also saved me. My love affair with the city started from the very first day. My soul had finally found its home. I started living in the pages of a book. Many are the authors that have led me in that journey. And of course, William Blake, who apart from the three years he lived in Felpham, conceived of his poetry and images here in London, is one of the most powerful ones. Um, this is the view from my window when I live in Finsbury Park. I believe everywhere all over London. <clears throat> By actually living in London, I started to understand Blake in a deeper level. I was now surrounded by the very city that inspired his visions, though the landscape has changed obviously since his time. Here in London, I could visit the places where Blake grew up and had his visions, like Peckham Rye, for instance, where he saw angels. And once I led a, a, a walk there trying to, to find three angels. Um, you recognize that. Uh, to me, life in London was just as it is in my novel, always suspended between real life and vision. London, as is well known, is a city of visionary, a city of the imagination as much as it is material. Blake saw this quite clearly, and for a Mexican who had been intrigued by Blake for so long, but didn't quite grasp the essence of his poetry and art, Coming to London was like an electric shock. The London of vision such as Blake's did exist. But then after this revelation, to go on working on my novel was also terrifying. On the one hand, Blake is a huge figure in the British culture, culture interpreted in too many differing and contradicting ways. On the other hand, by the mere physical act of being here, Blake's world was starting to open itself to me with many more layers as if for the first time, with further depth and myriads of meanings. And I realized I have probably not even started to understand it. Uh, this is uh, from the book of Tell, and Tell in, in that poem is um, a young woman who's asking herself many existential questions. So that's how I thought. <clears throat> I kept on working on the novel, but I could not concentrate properly on it. I ab abandoned it for months several times when I truly believed that I would never finish it and felt quite demoralized. I did finish other books meanwhile, but the novel was the most important of them all and I was failing. By now I had actually finished the novel three times. The three times it was rubbish and I had destroyed both the manuscript and the electronic files. I guess I was probably working like a reason. And if you have read Blake, you reason is this character that is a kind of ghost, but in the worst possible sense. That is, a, your reason probably means your reason. So it is rigid God that just writes command, uh, commandments and, and, and cannot see the, the exuberance of life and is just screwing things up, basically. So I think I was writing like him trying loosely to make sense, listening terrified to the way my reason was trying to structure a story that came from somewhere deeper. So I was very tormented. At the same time, lost though I was, I felt that Blake was my own. 
I liked being alone with him, walking through his London. I mistrusted academic interpretations of his work to a phobic extent and didn't want anything to do with groups of people or even individuals studying him. I will never join, I thought, such a thing as a black society of which later. Then a miracle happened, the grant. In mid 2008, I was awarded the coveted grant for the Mexican um, Sistema Nacional de Creadores, which allows Mexican writers and artists to work on their project for three full years. I got it again last December for another novel and I'm just as tormented as I was in this. So that was it, now I have no excuse. And I held to that chance religiously. I started from scratch all over again, my fourth attempt at writing the novel. But this strike of love itself raised another tough issue. Being realistic, I probably could not have written the novel in any other way because it was so ambitious and the struggle for survival was so hard. Yet this novel concerned with spiritual freedom and so marked by episodes of human pain inflicted on real people by a corrupt power, this novel that dwells on questions that do torment me, such as justice, truth, and an artist's call, was being written thanks to a grant awarded by the Mexican government. Do you think I'm despicable? The story of these grants is another very vast subject. We don't have time to go into them here. They were started by Mexican artists and authors. Uh, but still, uh, well, it's a very difficult question. And I also wonder how successful Blake was ne negotiating the difficult relationship between his unwavering principles and his quiet hard struggle for survival. Materially, William Blake failed, but spiritually, Probably not. <clears throat> anyway, I carry the novel with me, intellectually and physically, everywhere. When works on it, no matter what kind of problem, emergency, or tragedy was happening in my life. It was my life's true companion, and every day I found myself confronted by a world, the world of William Blake, that was ever more complex and more beautiful, too. Superstitiously, at least a fraction of my work had to take place every single day in a cafe. Blake forgot to say it, but Golgonusa, the sacred city of the arts, is full of cafes. No sacred city can survive without them. My nameless character who tells the story is also watching the world from a cafe table. So I am very aware of the continuity of my obsessions, my questions, and my attitude to writing stretched since the faraway days when, as a teenager, I started working on cafes in Guadalajara, my hometown, just so that I could be free. <clears throat> I also went often to Bonhill Fields in order to ask where, where Blake is buried, to ask for Blake's inspiration, help, or even forgiveness if I was um, doing things wrong. So London is a gay through to the other side of reality. Blake knew this, and that is why he could imagine London was that sacred city of creation, even though he certainly also saw the green, cruel, and merciless city. And the idea of the sacred city has always existed in the human imagination. In chapter one of Jerusalem, Blake writes, they came up to Jerusalem. They walked before Albion in the exchanges of London every nation walks and London walks in every nation, mutual in love and harmony. One of the central ideas that have emerged in my novel, that emerged in my novel was that even though cities can be the cruelest places where loneliness, crime and poverty dwell, where we can see the very worst of human beings, it is also probably only in cities that we can really learn to love humankind, not individuals only, but mankind itself. One curious thing I noticed since, working, since I was working on the last version was that I was much more aware of the presence of human pain. I went out in the street and could see it in the faces of people. I imagined their stories and was much more aware of how grief and fragility are so prevalent in what we are. We can see grief everywhere. Can it be truly redeemed by compassion? Pity was very important for William Blake, and pity is the attribute of any tarmon, 
on whom one of my main characters is inspired. So when I saw pain and obsessively wondered if it can be truly healed through love and pity, it brought me back to the question that made me start writing the novel in 1997. How can reason by itself make sense of things like grief and pity? And how can political reason with its foundations on abstract ideals and systems that reign over individuals find a humane answer to the infinite question of human vulnerability? Blake asked himself similar questions. He denounced all forms of tyranny, was inspired by the drama and quest for liberty of the American and French revolutions. He denounced slavery, the poverty and the horrid conditions of labor he saw around him. He dared to publish his poem, America, when it could have had serious repercussions for him in 1793, when it was a rather sensitive subject with a counter-revolutionary paranoia in the air. But he didn't think the answers to his conflicts were contained merely in political thinking. He sought the answer through poetic inspiration. In the tra tragedies of his time, he found symbols of the perpetual struggle of the different states we experience or embody while being human and thus reached beyond the transient. Blake or loss, which is a character that Blake created that is a kind of a um, mirror of himself, knows that reason, his cruel loss and repression and hate caused this destruction, but he also knows that there is love and forgiveness. In his prophetic poems, Blake went beyond the political in order to reach the spiritual. He sought freedom and meaning through artistic expression. The question is, of course, is that enough? Let's hear what Blake himself had to say in his address to the public in Jerusalem. Poetry fetter, fetters the human race. Nations are destroyed or flourish in proportion as their poetry, painting, and music are destroyed or flourish. The primeval state of man was wisdom, art, and science. This is a central issue in my novel. I don't know the answer. After all, I am a post-existentialist, post-postmodern, and post-everything writer, and so I am full of doubts. The deepest conviction of my heart that a materialistic approach that considers the world of the spirit a luxury, one can only nurture in peace is sterile and oppressive. The conviction, conviction that keeps me alive, that make of me a writer and gives sense and meaning to the world of my experience as a human being is contest, constantly contested by my reason. I believe that what makes me doubt sometimes and brings about my moments of ruin as a writer and, and as a person is what Blake symbolized through this character, reason, and the specter, which is also deadly in this poem. The rational, I'm quoting him, the rational power of the divided man, that's the specter. The rational power of the divided man. The false reasoning that justifies our delusions or selfish desires. I firmly believe that my inspiration is my greatest strength and what makes me be in the world. That is the divinity in all of us that Blake advocated and knew to be true. In Jerusalem, he wrote that each person's genius was the Holy Ghost in man. And then he adds, there is no other God than that God who is the intellectual fountain of humanity. Seen from this perspective, art is essential for the spiritual freedom of men and women. I, is this way of thinking escapism? That's another big question. And these doubts haunt my characters in the novel as well. My novel is narrated by a man who is a writer and who is full of doubts. He has in him some aspects of Blake and of Blake's character loss. And my character Elias is a kind of emanation of him, but he also is your reason. The story my narrator tells is that of all these characters who live a double life, visionary and material. Those characters, the narrator and myself, don't know which of both lives is the real one or if both can be so simultaneously. What is most sublime in this people's spiritual quest can also be the most pathetic mistake and source of pain for themselves and for others. They can be deluded 
then again, may, that may be inspired. My Elias, a kind of visionary projection of the projector, projection of the narrator, sorry, strives to find Golgonusa, the sacred city. And for that, he needs his emanation and Itarmo to be reunited with him. But Christina, who embodies Blake's character and Itarmo, is torn from him. She is called also by the forces of reason in the face of a very real human pain and tragedy. In my novel, the reasoning of politics makes her doubt. Another essential question is that of faith. Christina, this girl who comes from a Catholic orphanage and encounters the Blake Lost character, who is a man of faith, but through vision and inspiration, and who is utterly, like Blake, against institutionalized religion. Uh, they have this kind of conflict there. And there is also a character that symbolizes the realm of Beulah. Beulah in Blake is a source of inspiration and dreams between eternity and this material world who wonders about the meaning of the cross. The cross is a symbol that is constantly present, present in this novel and all the characters question it one way or another, seeking its true meaning. For the characters that represent reason, but also for the one who embodies orc, meaning revolution, faith is not enough and is even the enemy. It is escapism. Again, they consider religion only in its material embodiment. To them also, art must not be visionary, but socially politically committed. This is for this character. In this conception, a form of art that addresses the concept of the divine is therefore conservative and reactionary. I don't agree with them, but the questions are relevant. More and more, the only truths I really believe in are spiritual, for everything in the material world has its spiritual counterpart or balance. And my pain, rage and indignation in the face of the atrocities inflicted by humans or other humans in this world finds less and less of an echo in the discourse of politics or simplistic and equally repressive answers that only deal with what is immediate and tangible. Blake would have been willing to make public art he was a radical, only that he was never commissioned because people thought he was mad. He was a radical artist and a revolutionary who did not shy away from the real upheavals that affected people in his time. It is just that to him, there was no division between the world of the spirit and what we experience in this or mortal life. Uh, this is a combination of Mexico City, St. Paul's in London and Blake and Inash. So this is to talk a bit about my uh, novel's settings. I never say in the novel where it takes place. Mexican people will identify Acteal, this tragedy, this massacre immediately, and the horrors of present day Mexico. But still I refuse to identify it as, as Mexico, not out of a whim, but because I believe it may be possible to reflect the visionary nature of a place and thus break boundaries. Thus, in my novel, Mexico City is also London, though London is never mentioned either, and it is also Golgonusa, the sacred city. They are merging all the time. Imagination is the bridge between the three of them. And this chaotic geography in my novel seems perfectly logical to me. It is what has to be if the novel is to have any truth in it. Because of this double reality, my novel, apart from being very long, is in many ways incomprehensible. And I am aware of that. I wasn't being lazy by allowing it to be incomprehensible. I was trying to reach deep in the questions, intuitions, doubts, and truths that made me start writing it. The visionary is in the novel as much as I am able to express it. And the visionary is incomprehensible. It is not part of your reason's realm. In that sense, I think that a good deal of Blake's prophetic poems are incomprehensible. That's what I knew when I started reading them. At the same time that they are living timeless images of truth. I want to be faithful too to my own visions and to nothing else. As I said before, a fundamental symbol in my novel is that of the cross. I have tried to understand Blake's view of it and I have been very confused. The figure of Christ is very important in my novel. 
my characters find some revelations through the symbol of the cross. Though some of them quite misguided, as is the case of a stigmatic nun who never reaches true vision. My character that symbolizes or dies in the novel. Then while I was working on the novel, I was very shocked by the real story of a young activist whose name was Pavel Gonzalez in Mexico, who was kidnapped, murdered, tortured, and then left tied to a cross on top of an extinct volcano. And that is the place where his corpse was left. I mean, that. Um, I was very shaken by this. And I found that the horrendous story involved in a symbolic way much of what I was trying to find and express through that character of mine. So my own orc ends up, instead of being bound to a rock by the chance of jealousy, as is the case in Blake, crucified on top of the mountain. Of course, I was even more scared of using like this someone's real tragedy in my novel, but somehow in my deepest being, I don't feel using is the right word. I can't help believing that the tragedy has revealed something that is important in many levels and not only political. Once the novel was published, I sent it to Pavel's mother, absolutely terrified of what her reaction would be, but she, she was very moved and, 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 and uh, I think she understood what I was trying to do. One of my questions is, can in my novel, the terrible sacrifice at the cross be turned into this liberating vision? This is Blake 76 from Jerusalem, uh, this longest of the Blake's prophetic poems. Usually it's called Albion before Christ crucified on the tree of knowledge of good and evil. As with most Blake, not all the interpretations of this image coincide. But what does it mean? One thing at least is clear. The identification between Albion and Christ in their mirror attitudes. Albion, who for Blake is humanity. There is no cross here, but a tree heavy with golden fruits. And Albion, humanity, in his nakedness and vitality, is a powerful image of freedom. Christ's sacrifice may have been an in Blake's eyes, the cross, the instrument of vengeance and the symbol of a religion of death, but the love and forgiveness that move God to identify with the man or the other way around are not in question in Blake. Here, as the victim Christ is mirrored by, by, by Albion in all his force and power, or at least that's how I see it, there is more hope than death and there is certainly freedom. I don't know if the characters in my novel or the novel itself managed to reach this redemption, this salvation from spiritual death, but they certainly aim at it in the unorthodox way in which Blake conceived Christianity. Let's remember that he wrote in Jerusalem in the address to the Christians. I'm, I'm quoting, I know of no other Christianity and of no other gospel than the liberty, both of body and mind, to exercise the divine arts of imagination. Imagination, the real and eternal world of which this vegetable universe is but a faint shadow. So the saga of my novel and my relationship with Blake continues for several years in London. That is um, Lam the tower in Lambeth Palace and Blake lived for a while in Lambeth. Uh, I came and went through the Black Society, a truly life-threatening episode which may have destroyed my innocence, but certainly gave me a lot of experience. And, um, and I kept on working. Those had notes for the chapters in my novel. Uh, this is manuscript, <laughs> some of the correct uh, revisions in the manuscript. I thought I had finished it in 2011, but when I found a publisher, Later, years later, I went through it again and made more revisions in 2018. Um, my lovely editor in Alfaguara, Ramon Cordova, who really had faith in the novel, sadly died shortly after it was published. And the big Penguin Random House conglomerate that Alfaguara belongs to abandoned the book. So I had yet another tough battle to fight. But when things go wrong, I still find support thinking of Blake's resilience. 
there are many more things that happen in my novel with which I won't bore you here. But maybe one of the its most significant outcomes is that my characters do find Golgonusa, the sacred city. That is indeed the sacred city of arts and science. They find it. And in it, there dwells holiness and redemption. And yet, there is sadness and pain in it. We then take a leap into another layer of reality, one closer to our own, which is the one of the character who tells the story. And he realizes while working in a cafe, where else could it be, in the face of much human misery, that indeed that city in this or sad material world inhabited by mortal men and women is Polgonusa, spiritual force of London, just the London that is out there, where beauty can indeed be found. If we seek, for be seek beauty, if we follow the thread that has marked the path of beauty throughout our lives, then we can find it. Maybe even like uh, this image is of uh, Acteal when they were mourning the dead, the victims, and they are creating beauty there with all the, the lights and, and the devotion. And um, in the community of Las Abecas has, has somehow been reborn out of this tragedy with great courage and, and beauty. So, uh, well, there are here more notes for the novel. And what is beauty then, if not the inalienable and inexpressible truth found in our own visions? But in the end, as my nameless character narrator says in the novel, this is only literature. My pursuit is only words. Before I finish, I don't know if we have time for either questions or reading a bit of a chapter in English. But first of all, I want to thank very, very much all of you who came here. And again, the Center for Mexican Studies in UK and Elena Gonzalez Trevino, as always, thank you, thank you very much, who's the director of the center. Uh, to the whole team, Sara Masu, Angelica Cruz, uh, Carla Chavez, always very, very supportive. And to the Sistema Nacional de Creadores de Arte and the Mexican Embassy in the UK. So you tell me if I have time for anything else or questions or they are going to kick us out in the <laughs> The reading, yeah. Well, this is, this is a, it's not, not the whole chapter because the chapter is too long for reading here, but it's excerpts from the chapter of, um, it's called La Madre Dolorosa, which in English means the mother, mother of sorrows. I forgot to say the quote there, exuberance is beauty is obviously from, from Blake. So the, in this chapter, this character, who is a uh, Blake's Edith Armon, but in my, in my novel is called Christina, she is the mother of Orc, this revolutionary character who is murdered and, and tied to the cross. So she, after they find him, she's climbing to the mountain, trying to see where his son was, her son was left. <clears throat> She wanted to climb the mountain, to reach the top, the place where they had found him. She didn't know if he had died there or somewhere else, if it was only his inert body that had been dragged all the way up there, impervious to the landscape's beauty. She didn't believe she would ever find out, but nevertheless desired to go, to imagine that she could recover through her eyes her son's last look. The climb was hard and the top looked so distant she was not sure that she would reach it. But she wasn't surprised that in summer, when the weather was more propitious, excursionists were intent on going up that road. The more she climbed, the purer and more crystal clear the air was. The farther the world remained, the dirtiness of men's forced communion with its horrors. Her known perception, but that's not true. It was somehow sharper, more vivid, was no longer fixed on the idea of ascending the mountain where they had hung the corpse of her son. She did not forget, could not forget, 
but in the slow and concentrated hours of her ascent, it started to become something else. To reach the top, the mountain's full height, the quiet of the soul in possession of itself in its way up through grass and sheer rock, the effort of her whole body, the tension in her muscles, sweat and thirst were a minimal offering for the privilege of getting there and seeing. The images accompanied her. She didn't know where they came from and did not see them with her eyes, but in the half-lit theater inside her head. They did not surprise her, did not scare her. She did nothing to check them off because she understood they were part of the ascent, as much as the rock beneath her feet, her hands hurt by nettles. It was she, young and pure as a lily on the top of a tower, the earth shaking at her feet and the immense shadow, as if of a black bird plunging from up high with a secret wail that only she could hear, hear and that on falling cleans her. It was the beautiful face of her loving mother, Ahenia, clean as well, a living face, breathing skin, eyes moist with so much light, very close to hers, her soft and white hand caressing her, stroking her cheeks. It was her own womb, swollen and hard, full of Hernan's life striving to come out, an urgency of life and light that filled her as if it was gold that ran in her blood. And a tall rose bush, taller than all the trees in the forest, the red roses all throbbing in unison as an immense heart beating with hers, and the closed faces with a kind of silvery skin as if beneath a strange light, who dragged their feet down a silent and magnificent city, the streets paved in gold, and she weaving tirelessly, a cloth with no definite color, iridescent, with which she envelops in the morgue her son's lacerated body, and then the matter that gave form to that sinister place with stained tile walls, the smell of disinfectant that never managed to mask the smell of death, dissolved. And there was the mountain again, the mountain that was a volcano burning beneath, though now slumbering, the almighty fire that abolished all crimes and man's wickedness with a bigger cruelty which was pure and wholesome violence, the air's entrails burning like hers when Hernan inhabited her, the volcano that contained the fire that was her son, dead and never dead, her ascent again, her eyes moist only with the bright light they received, her eyes now without tears. She finally saw it from far away, the cross crowning the mountain top. It was a simple and humble wooden cross, no more. She did not allow herself to call to her memory a single line, not even a shadow of the terrible image she had envisaged before, before the ascent. Her son's inanimate, sold and broken body hanging from the cross. No, she would not see it. She would only see the signs of the world spreading around, nothing else. She climbed a little bit farther. The last stretch always the harvest, holding fast to the rock until she reached the highest point in the valley, the closest point to the sky up there in the crater's mouth that then ran down until it touched Earth's everlasting living fire. She had to touch the cross. The surface was so narrow up there. She had to support herself on it in order to get up and see. The other volcanoes facing her, crowned with snow, the snow drawing a heavy and sweet cloak of the leaning slip upon the blue rock, and below the mineral nature overflowing in the mystery of its shapes, the lower mountains, the solid rock, the hills, and down in the depths of the green valley and the expanses gilded by the wheat's ears and the green of corn, the trees rocking with a slow doubling rhythm of bird song, the sky as she was so high above the wall, even higher, higher than ever, more infinite, more a pure blue made of mysterious hollowness gases and the void that embraced the world at the time it launched it into the universe vastness 
like a colored ball that now stayed fixed there with an almost hidden glow about to be revealed everywhere beneath the sun. The sun, it didn't burn anymore. The day had progressed. It was not a fixed point. It was only light, an expanse of light, an ocean of light that contained it all. Suddenly, Christina realized that everything she saw, what she had seen throughout her whole life, up to the most negligible crevice between the rocks, the smallest flower, the shadows in the night, as well as the endless purity of that sky, she saw because of the sun, that everything, the whole world was embraced by it. The light made her giddy. She held to the cross so that she wouldn't fall and she thought she saw very close to her face, so close that it was as if seated inside her, her son's visage, his eyes open, dark and living with his look fixed on her, questioning her and everything around that face that had the wholesome beauty of life burned like a halo. It was the sun and the fire. She closed her eyes, treasuring that vision, the true vision of Hernan at his life's end. And when she opened them again, the face was still there, slowly being transformed as an image beneath the stirred ripples of a lake. Now it was Erat's face, her father's. They were the same face. Then the light covered it, its features vanished in the radiance. With cautious movement, she sat at the cross's feet and rested her back against the timber, facing the snow peaks of the other volcanoes. Was there blood staining the cross? And what if there was? It would be her son's blood, like every man's blood, like the slow rust of metal beneath the ring, like the taste of light in her mouth and light in her eyes. She thought it was strange to know that other hikers would go climbing to that same place, enthralled by the breathtaking beauty of the landscape, that they would stop in that same spot with perhaps a sensation of triumph, others with a true transfiguration of the soul without knowing the terrible story of that mountain top and that cross, without knowing of, that, of the atrocious crime that had brought her, the mother, there. How strange. Strange it would be, she thought, and yet she knew it was all right that way, that that light, which was the sun, cleansed them all, returned the absurd and gratuitous crime to its miserable origin, and in its place unfolded the greatness of a world in harmony, with love in men's hearts, whose images penetrated the marvel of the retina and its chambers of light. Had they seen it, she wondered, even for a second, the murderers who had dragged her son's body up there. She could not find forgiveness in her heart, but it wasn't an urgent need. She found instead a warm ember of pity. The evening progressed. She knew because of the blue paling around her in the cold, because of the distant shimmering, reddish and amber, down below in the valley, the city lights. She turned her eyes towards that glow, she expected to see the great spider of light of the immense city spreading into the infinite, but it wasn't that what she saw. She saw the trembling lights concentrated around an expanse bounded amidst the mountains. They trembled as a mirage does in the heat, and yet their glow was as intense as a coffer full of jewels that had suddenly been opened. She saw the dome crowned by the cross that cast its golden glitter the tall stylized towers, the carved lattice of the city's skyline. The other city, the one she believed impossibly hidden beneath the earth, the one she had only barely glimpsed, the one Elias had looked for all his life. It existed, it was there, offering itself to her as a fruit on the palm of a colossal mighty hand. The vision lasted for a very long moment before vanishing in the river of light of the bigger city, grown without rhyme or reason, with its rumors, where men face up to their lights, scraping hope as best they could, out from the streets, the walls, showing the bitter pebble of their miseries and crimes. She knew then that she would not go back home. Thank you.
I don't know if we have time for any comments, questions. Complaints. <laughs> this, this is deep, so it's not so easy to. <laughs> Come on. So. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. We have another talk. I, I'll be doing another talk. I don't know if in the same room. No, I think it's a, a different room. But I well, we'll. But end of April on the 27th, that, that's going to be about my experience with um, Mexican uh, rock music as um, in, in the fight for freedom. <laughs> so you will be all invited to that one as well. And thank you, thank you very much. There are some books for sale. There are books for sale as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Lori? <laughs> you're you're well, not that much. So somebody asks you what the novel is about. What do you tell them? <laughs> oh, bloody hell. I know you always need like a short. That's very, very difficult to do, but I, I, I will say it's about the quest for the, uh, or the question, uh, the quest of, of, of the redemption of human pain in the context of William Blake's prophetic poems. William Blake's prophetic poems. But that, it is more complicated. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? Thank you. I want to read that. You must send me the the, the talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but purely a Bolivian thing to do what she, what she did. <laughs> Thank you. I, I I was trying, but uh, but as, as you can see in, in, in my talk, I did it full of doubts, and I still haven't an answer to those doubts. No, I, I think there is no concrete answer. No, because there's there's a point where Incredible indifference of life, life, life itself, for example, it's us who decide what it cares on, yeah. what level we, we, we take it, and we don't have any say unless we, we, we want, if you choose to, to make one up as in mm. religion or in political certainty, so then we have to be too hard and make things. But yeah. I, I think it's an honest. 
point to reach. Like, I don't have it. No. But we just keep on looking. Yeah. That's that's the human path. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, Zing. It's a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.